Plenty of games I've made my girlfriend play made her get good at killing things. But this is the first time a game wants her to do something she's already good at, not hurting a thing. When it comes to being kind and making friends, she excels. So I knew Undertale would be a great choice for the next game to make her play. It's the perfect game for someone who prefers to lay down their swords and talk things out. A conveniently shaped lamp. When I pitched it to her, I told her it was a game where she didn't have to destroy anything. And that was enough to get her interested. Filled with determination, I made my girlfriend play Undertale. Undertale is an unconventional game, which I think is perfect for our unconventional game. Hello. Arguably what makes Undertale so unique is that you don't have to fight and kill the enemies and can talk them down and spare them. In fact, in most cases, it's usually better to solve your problems as peacefully as possible. She knew Mercy was an option going into her playthrough, but didn't exactly know how to go about it. I'm just complimenting frogs. Despite that, she caught on to the morality of the game quickly and refused to use violence from the very start. All that said, I didn't explain there was a special ending to the game for never gaining a single XP. I wanted to let her playthrough be her own. I was curious to see how far she'd be able to take true pacifism. And if not, at what point she'd finally turn to violence. Damn. What? Oh my god! Tori wants to fight me? I'm not gonna fight you. You're nice to me. You made me a pie. No. Ah! I'm so bad at dodging the little balls. On that note, let's talk about her first boss fight. I thought this might be where she'd initially break her pacifism. The puzzle for sparing Toriel is to repeatedly try and spare her despite getting a message of failure over and over and over again. This is basically the standard RPG shorthand for, this doesn't work, try something else. But in reality, the solution here is to realize Undertale's mechanics aren't meant to be interpreted as traditional raw game mechanics. To an RPG player, the game is sending a clear message that attempting to spare over and over is a waste of your turn. It throws a lot of people off, and many players will experiment with fighting here if they haven't done so yet. I know that I did, which is still painful to think about to this day. Well, what should be the solution? Ironically, while the morality puzzle here throws a complete curveball at the average RPG player, it's surprisingly well suited for my girlfriend, who not only has limited experience playing turn-based RPGs, but also always applies her morality to the choices in games. Let's not forget she spent half an hour trying to find a way to avoid incinerating her companion cube. So despite seeming like she wasn't getting anywhere, she was determined to show mercy. And part of what makes Undertale so special is that it rewards that determination. No! Stay in the middle. <gasps> She's lonely. Having learned this lesson early on, the rest of the encounters in the game switched from can they be spared to how do I spare them. She wasn't afraid to try anything, which was good, because that's exactly how Undertale wants you to look at it. She had no preconceived notions about games to get in her way to puzzling out how to save everyone. But at the same time, her biggest obstacle of all stood up loud and clear, actually playing the game. Staying alive long enough to spare a monster was the real challenge for her and her pacifism. Damn it. No. so bad at those. When choosing to act instead of fight, you have all sorts of different options with each enemy, like talking, laughing, and even flirting with them. The challenge is usually an exercise in learning how each enemy reacts to certain acts and figuring out what order you need to do them in to get the option to spare. It makes things fun because the fights start to feel more like a puzzle, and one thing I always liked was that each new encounter was something new to solve. In the same way, remembering what each monster likes is part of that exercise. And for my girlfriend, it's an exercise in patience. Pet, 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 pet. Maybe I'll pretend it. Oh, it hit me, okay. Every act done out of order or incorrectly is one additional gauntlet of white pellets to avoid and one additional opportunity for a girlfriend game over. Oh, so the other guy wants to be pet too. Shit. No, I died! Tarn, stay determined! 
I'm not giving up. I'm having fun. When the enemies attack, you get placed in a box and have to dodge their specific bullet hell style attacks. It's pretty straightforward, but my girlfriend had a questionable approach to say the least. For one thing, I noticed she was glued to the corners of the box for some reason, regardless of the type of attack. She didn't know this, but you aren't even necessarily supposed to die on Toriel because the attacks stop aiming at you when you're at 1 HP. But since she would always dive straight for the corners, she got hit and died in what's supposed to be more or less a scripted fight. Did I just die? Oh my god, I died. Shit. Another major mistake she'd make is never holding still when an attack was on the screen. Moving just for the sake of moving dealt her a lot of unnecessary damage. But probably the most hilarious of all was when it came to blue objects. Which don't hurt you if you don't move. These are arguably some of the easier attacks to dodge, but she was so squeamish I think she couldn't help but move. Fortunately, as with most games, practice goes a long way. And even though she wasn't perfect by any metric, she improved quite a bit. Oh my god. I'm wiggling too. Oh my god. It's breakfast time! Oh my god. <sighs> Let's eat it's a hot cat. Meow, meow, meow. You just want meow, meow, meow? <laughs> When it comes to fighting some of the bigger boss battles, your heart will usually change its color, and in doing so, it changes how it works. What the hell? I'm blue now. This flipped everything she thought she knew about how things worked on their head, and she wasn't exactly quick to adjust. She did better with some than others, but it's safe to say the color changing fights were ones she got the most hung up on. Um, I'm yellow. Hell yeah! I have a gun! <laughs> Says the pacifist. Random encounters are something she's still getting used to. She usually has a hard time with them because they make going out and exploring feel like an uphill battle. On the one hand, she wants to see what's around the corner, but on the other, she runs the risk of running into an enemy she's not familiar with and dying. Damn it, I keep walking and then something wants to fight me. Exploring was just as much of a source of anxiety though, because the world feels so big and scary the first time in it. I could tell that early in the playthrough, she walked around overly cautious and suspicious of everything, but I think she loosened her grip as she started to get further along and meet more of the characters. <laughs> no! He tripped! Aw, I like being friends better. Both the encounters and the world feeling big and scary fed to possibly one of her biggest anxieties of all, save points. I found this hilarious because every save point in the game has an inspiring message to fill you with determination. But for her, every stretch between saves was like a gauntlet. She was constantly anxious about saving her game, and I think it mostly had to do with feeling unconfident in her abilities. She'd turn back to save all too often when she was maybe one or two rooms away from the next one. The irony was she definitely ran into more encounters that way than if she'd just pressed ahead. After dying and having to retrace her steps a few times, she started to realize things weren't as big and long as she thought. What felt like a huge trek from save point to save point was actually a pretty quick walk once you knew where to go and how to solve the puzzles. On top of that, the encounters weren't nearly as big of an obstacle once you cracked how to spare the enemy, so dying became more funny than upsetting. Shit. Undertale is full of all sorts of fun and quirky things that you probably won't discover on your first time through. It was hard not to just blurt out all the tricks and secrets for her, especially when she was really struggling with something and I knew there was an easier way. I must have watched her die to the greater dog guard half a dozen times and I swear, watching her solve the sliding puzzle over and over and over again had me almost ready to crack. No one tell her she could have used the stick to skip all the dog encounters because I'm not going to be getting the same mercy the monsters do if she finds out. Even still, your first playthrough is a special thing and I wouldn't want to ruin any of the quirkiness for her. A legendary artifact. I'm carrying too many dogs. Since when did I get this annoying dog? It's fast asleep. Nick, come here. Let's look at this. So I found a legendary artifact. Will you take it? So I say yes. And so I'm carrying one too many dogs. You're carrying too many dogs. And so then when I um go into my items, I don't know when I got this, but I'm carrying an annoying dog. 
Annoying dog. A little white dog. It's fast asleep. <laughs> what the hell do I do? I want to keep carrying a dog. When did this crawl into my backpack? Oh my God. Do you remember? I don't want to drop the little dog, but I want this artifact. Another side effect of playing for the first time is that she used items that are super useful later on without realizing it and then paid dearly for it. My girlfriend has never struggled with too good to use syndrome, but this is the first game where it finally caught up with her. Plenty of the items you find along the way have hidden uses and in some cases allow you to skip entire boss fights when used correctly. We can't expect her to know these things on the first playthrough, but it was always funny to taunt her a little bit about eating her donuts or cinnamon buns when she learned they could have come in handy. Yes. Man, I ate that. The game took her a lot longer to play than I would have expected. Her refusal to hurt anything and clumsily figure out how to pacify the enemies played a good part in it, but I think she spent about as much time just standing around confused and thinking. The story has a lot of depth to it, and there's quite a bit to find if you're interested in looking. Whoop, whoop. This led to lots of standing still and overthinking things. Oh no, I'm trying to remember the rules, shit. One of the reasons she got frustrated with the random encounters was she felt like they were interrupting her all the time because she just wanted to play. At the time, I was thinking how irritated she'd get when more characters get a hold of her cell phone number and she starts getting calls and texts about as often as those encounters. But she actually didn't mind at all. She wasn't annoyed later in the game because by then her whole goal had shifted to making friends. At that point, even the random encounters weren't a nuisance and she found them fun. You could clearly see her attitude change to where she stopped thinking about this like a game and switched to seeing it for what it was, a story. Oh, I'm done. She's really hot. Here, cool off. I know we were fighting, but maybe you can forgive me though? And after sparing the major boss fights, you have the option to get to know them better and even go on dates. I think once she started to get attached to all the different characters, you started to see her shift in tone and really get into it. She went out of her way not just to spare them, but also to get to know them. And it's safe to say she knows a thing or two about how to have fun on date night. <laughs> the dating power is off the charts. It's clear now. <laughs> yes, Papyrus. A side effect of this was her progress slowed to a crawl, as she carefully read every conversation and examined every object she could, all just to get as much story as possible. Interacting with all the different NPCs and minibosses is totally worth it for the dialogue, but it wasn't something I'd have expected her to do when she first started. What's the most important ingredient? There's a chainsaw. I think it's important to point out that this is a game that's aware it's a game. There's a camera hidden in the bushes, what? Undertale has a strong meta-narrative woven into its story, and some of the characters are even aware that you're reloading save files and leaving the game. It's smart and knows what you're doing and will call you out on it, which is funny and clever, but in some cases, it seems like it had a better idea of what she was supposed to be doing than she did. She can counter lucky stars that the game was watching out for her, because plenty of other more punishing games would have left her for dead. Shit. Oh, thank God. Alvin! <laughs> why, why were the lasers necessary then? Undertale's all about subverting your expectations, and its narrative is no exception. The story leads you in one direction before yanking you back another way. Just when you think you've got it all figured out, it'll find a way to make you think twice. And I really appreciate how it manipulates you. She totally thought she knew what was going on toward what she believed to be the end of the game, but in reality, she was like half right. Tarn? Oh my god, are these the, the souls? And they had one for me? Because I have the red heart? Oh my god. I don't want to die. Tard, stay determined. Probably my favorite example of her thinking she was at the end was how almost every room before the fight with Asgore has a save point in it. It was like every single save felt like it was the last one before the big final fight. She'd do all the hyping herself up and nervous preparation before facing the boss, and then she'd walk into another room with a save point. Ironically, her past self would have been envious of having more saves than she knew what to do with. There's so many saves. Up until now, she's shown mercy in every single fight she came across, but this was the first time it was taken away from her. Oh my god! 
Aside from the initial shock of feeling like she was going to be forced to finally take a life, she also had literally never selected the fight option, had no clue how the menu even worked. Why does this look like a canoe? The fact that the king didn't want to fight her about as much as she didn't want to fight him helped her come to terms with the fact it was probably okay to use the fight command in this battle. After reluctantly swinging her knife around for the first time in the game, she was relieved to realize she would still have the option to show mercy. Although she never predicted what was coming next. <laughs> And a quick side note, her desktop is totally cluttered and she knows it. Those are all the different games she's played or we've played for videos, and like deer antlers mounted over a fireplace, she looks at them like trophies from games she's conquered, so there's no talking her into cleaning it up a bit. Anyways, back to Flowey and Undertale. What the hell? One day they all disappeared without a trace? What? So if I had a nickel for every time a game's narrative deleted my girlfriend's save file, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? You forget about escaping to your old save file. It's gone forever?! I have to say, I'm really glad I had her play Nier Automata first, because she had a genuine fear about the safety of her save file during this whole sequence. What is going on? I can dodge now. What the fuck?! What the hell is this?! Oh my god! My girlfriend's had her fair share of unique boss fights, but this is the first time she's had a boss that beats her so badly the game crashes. I gotta hand it to her though, she stayed determined. <gasps> My health bar's back! I don't know what I did! No! It's going psychedelic stop! <laughs> this got nuts! The flower! After defeating Flowey, she'd successfully completed the neutral ending of the game. With that said, she still had more to do thanks to San's assessment of her time in the underground. Love 2 is an acronym. It stands for Level of Violence! Oh my god! <laughs> There's a bit more to the game if you took the time to be a true pacifist, and some secrets are still tucked away waiting to be discovered. After poking around and tying up the loose odds and ends, the only thing left to do is to see what would happen if you fight the final boss again. <gasps> what? <gasps> Turn! 
Mario! What? Did you just say that about your husband? They're all my friends! <gasps> no! My friends! <laughs> no! <gasps> I have one more health! They're all protecting me! Oh my god, all my friends are here! Look at the dogs! It's the little monster kid and the spider! They're like, you're like, no! No, my friends! They're all my friends! Psychedelic? It's the end. Ah! ah! Oh my God. something else <gasps> my friends Yay! more person Baby, go to hug. <laughs> We're hugging. So after all that, she successfully managed to play the game and do it her way without destroying anyone. And like before, she was rewarded for all her efforts, leaving her filled with determination. That's so cute. And why is my name Frisk? <laughs> 